Thank you very much. Okay, well, actually, I'd like you to ignore and forget this technology for the moment um, that's, that's running here and uh, think about the moon. I think the moon's played an incredibly important role in Chinese culture. It defines the calendar, and it's also been the source of inspiration for thousands of poets and artists and writers. So, in ancient times, to take the idea of the moon and express it, it was quite a complex process, and it was done using oracle bones. Producing this kind of artifact was, was very difficult, and it was a magical and mysterious process. And it was confined to a very, very small proportion of the population. And it was used to hold things like divination ceremonies. So people used the flow of information um, as a form of control, and there was very limited access because it was so difficult to produce. You think about what happened when pen and brush and ink and paper came along. Suddenly it opened up the ability for people to express their ideas to a much broader audience. It also generated new art forms, calligraphy, painting, etc. And provided a route for people to join the government through examinations and through writing of histories and things like that. So slowly, the number of people who were able to express their ideas increased. Print was a major revolution. You think about it, Chinese printing machines in particular. Very complex devices because of the numbers of characters. Actually setting up a press for a book took a long time. And it required a huge amount of investment in terms of the machinery and in terms of the typesetting and then actually distributing the books. So again, you had a small group of people who were very much in, in control of the means of production. Although at the same time, you're expanding the overall size of the market and the readership by making it more broadly available. Now, along came the computer, and things have changed quite considerably. Now we can all express our feelings about the moon using a computer. We can do it graphically, we can write, we can do mashups, we can do all kinds of things. And we can, we can broadcast it to an absolutely global audience. At the same time, however, what that has meant is there's an increased pressure for innovation. Everyone now can produce on a computer. I think hundreds of millions of people worldwide. People can access it on the internet. So it means there's more and more pressure for on us to create better, more interesting, more compelling content. Same time, it's putting pressure on traditional publishing models. Before, a TV station or a magazine was a license to print money, and then suddenly it's not so easy now because uh, so many people can, can produce content. Now we're seeing a new revolution for touch on tablets or smartphones. And you see an accompanying revolution in terms, of, again, of the way we interact and generate content through, for example, mobile apps on your phone and on your tablet. So the audience is increasing. Pretty close now to a billion smartphone users, and that will continue to grow. And computer users will also continue to increase as well. But at the same time, the barriers of entry continue to go down, because more and more of us can do it. So, a lot of people are beginning to wonder, what is the next big trend? Last five years in technology, you've seen this tremendous growth in smartphones. Markets come from nowhere, suddenly you see all the excitement, say, around the iPhone 5 that was launched last week. And then that sense of disappointment, there's no, sense, there's no wow factor that got people really, really excited. And that showed, really, that the evolution of the technology has reached a certain level of maturity. So, what is the next big thing? Well, we believe the next big thing is actually not just one big thing. It's going to be millions of little things. And what's going to make that possible? It's 3D printing. Now, 3D printing has been around for quite a while now, in the background, going on. It was sort of invented in the University of Bath by, by a professor there. And then there have been companies like MakerBot in the US who started to work to popularize the technology. So now we're in a situation where a 3D printer costs, for a consumer, probably around $2,000. It's 
In other words, it's pretty much the same price as a printer used to cost for a PC network or even for one for your home. And you can see that the prices will continue to go down in the future. So it's going to become a truly um, accessible technology for everyone. So what 3D printing does, it gives the idea, it gives the promise that everyone could be a maker. Tomorrow I know at, the, at TEDx there's also a talking about maker. But using a 3D printer, we can print our own clothes, maybe. We can print our own ornaments. Or we can do devices like this. I mean, these are just some of the examples that, that, that we've done. Um, we can actually make things for ourselves. If we want to be a little bit more creative, we can actually make things. We can maybe sell things. Think of it. It's perfect, just-in-time build-to-order. That Somebody sees it. They like it. You send a file to the printer. Bang. It's done or they purchase the file, or you share the file with them, they print it on their printer. So it opens up these tremendous opportunities. And it also opens up the possibility for going on, say, a website like Kickstarter. I don't know whether you're familiar with it, but if you have an idea, you go and present your idea, and people will fund the idea. So actually you have this chance to create an amazing business, also out of 3D printing. But actually, Yes, everyone can be a maker, but it requires a team to make it really happen. A couple of weeks ago at VIA, we, we hosted together with USAN Ventures um, the first hardware software business startup event in the world, not just in Taiwan. And we had over 100 people come and we put them into teams and then they all came out with ideas for what kind of products for the future that they would like to create. And what was very clear is that it requires multiple disciplines. If you're a designer, you're not necessarily a manufacturer. If you're a software engineer, and having worked in the industry for 20 years, I can tell you this, but it doesn't mean you understand hardware. Um, you need to be able to bring all these skills together into a team to make it happen. VIA, we've been in the technology business for a long time. And we mainly focused on creating platforms. At TED Shanghai, a few months ago, we introduced this, which is uh, called APC, and it's a $49 PC, the first one in the world to use Android. That was about creating a platform. At the time, we looked at it, and uh, there's no case. And people say, well, why is there no case? And one of the reasons is we want people to think and build the cases themselves. And one thing they can do, actually, is use a 3D printer to create the case and prototype it. So what we've put together here is our 3D printing platform. As you can see, it's kind of a messy process. You've got, you've got a PC, you've got a motherboard, you've got your power, and then you've also got the printer itself. And all these things need to work together. So what we're focusing on is trying to integrate and make it smooth and make it easy for people to carry out. We've even got some software controls we've put in there, um, which makes the processing and the production of the files much easier. But as I said earlier, I think what's important also, it's not just about technology. It's not just about creating a platform. It's about creating an ecosystem and a culture around it, a culture that encourages collaboration. Chinese poets used to get inspiration from the moon alone, probably, um, drinking a few glasses of wine. Um, unfortunately, that's not the model for this kind of innovation, much as um, I would enjoy that. It's about bringing people together from different disciplines and figuring out how they can all fit into the picture and contribute towards it. Now, Taiwan actually has an amazing infrastructure for making this happen. It's got a world-leading PC industry, IT hardware. And if anything's held it back, in my opinion, is that um, it's always relied on Intel and Microsoft to do the thinking. And that was OK when the PC industry is really growing. But then now, suddenly, you've got to do something different. You've got to think of something different. But we have a very, very powerful IT industry of growing software and cloud service capabilities, a creative community we can all see today, an entrepreneurial spirit that has really driven the growth of this island, very, very strong manufacturing capabilities, and a government that encourages this kind of environment. And then finally, I'm starting to see emergence of collaboration spaces where people are coming together to do this kind of thing. So 3D inspiration is about what? 
It's about taking an idea, something simple like this. It actually may look quite simple, but this is a moon, which we printed earlier. It's about taking that idea and turning it into a product. Now, to begin with, that product could be quite a simple product. It could be smaller, be, maybe be some jewellery, or it could be a paperweight in the office. It could maybe be a different colour. It could maybe have characters on it. It could maybe have logos and all kinds of things. So the first stage is simple productization. Second, though, it provides a way through the prototyping for storification and socialization. One of the hot phrases in the industry is the Internet of Things. What is going to happen in the future? How are we going to embed the Internet into everyday devices? This provides a perfect vehicle for making that happen. Just think in the future, you add in Internet connectivity. You add in sensors. So maybe you can have environmental information, weather information, picking that up. You add in video capabilities, or you add in um, audio. And suddenly, you've got a product roadmap. You've got a story around the product. You've also got a clear product identity built around your original concept. You can also share that concept, share that IP in files with other people working on, on similar things. So, this is the kind of process that we need to be thinking about in the future. Create the idea, productize it, start with the simple stuff, get the feedback from the market. From that, build the story, build the roadmaps, socialize it by getting it connected, and sensification. This may sound a little bit fanciful right now, but the speed that technology is moving in, um, it's going to happen very fast. I said also, it's also about collaboration. No longer can an individual have a great idea. It needs a team. It needs people who've got capabilities in all different areas that perhaps before wasn't quite necessary. Then it's to prototype. The great thing about the web is if you have a lousy idea, you don't have to spend a million dollars finding out that nobody wants to buy it. You can put up the design and people will tell you. And that's how prototyping can help. And then the next stage is actual manufacturing. As I mentioned earlier, Taiwan has that base. It's got thousands of great manufacturers who can turn a product into, who can turn an idea into a mass pro, uh, produced product. And finally, it's about morphing. Morphing, taking it beyond the original idea into all different areas. So, just to finish, is, uh, we're back to the moon. While I've been printing, you can see um, the, how it works. And um, we also have a demo over there when it's finished. Um, but this is just the start. I think the potential of this technology is enormous. And it really gives us an opportunity to shoot for the moon in the future. Thank you.